Well, hey, everyone, and welcome. We're glad you're joining us, whether uh, you're joining us on our website or Facebook page or our YouTube channel. We're just glad you're here with us uh, to worship God and to hear from His Word. Uh, Today, we conclude a series over the last four weeks. This is the fourth part in a four-week series called The Rhythm of Rest. We've been examining the Old Testament law of Sabbath and the New Testament teaching about Sabbath and what that has to do with us who follow Jesus today. What does Sabbath mean? What does rest look like? What's the heart of what God's Word is really trying to tell us in this thing called Sabbath? I don't know about all of you, but one of the things that God has revealed to me throughout this series uh, is how restless I truly am. I don't think I was paying attention to that. I think maybe I was um, aware of it as background noise in my soul, but not aware of how much I need his rest. Um, And there are things I need to do and things I need to stop doing in order to experience the rest that Jesus invites us into. I hope that's true for you as well, that you're discovering what the invitation really is and what it really means. C.S. Lewis, in his famous uh, signature book, Mere Christianity, has a chapter in the last section called, Is Christianity Hard or Easy? It's a great question and a great title. And he says, from one perspective, if you're trying to earn God's favor and prove yourself as worthy and measure up, it's very hard. But from the perspective of Christ and the gospel and Sabbath rest, it's easy. This is what Jesus says. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let me read to you what Lewis says. That's why the real problem of the Christian life comes where people do not usually look for it. It comes the very moment you wake up each morning. All your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists simply in shoving them all back and listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other stronger, quieter life come flowing in. And so on all day, standing back from all of our fussings and frettings, coming in out of the wind. I love that last line, coming in out of the wind. That's essentially what Sabbath is coming in out of the wind of the noise of our culture and the noise in our soul and in our minds and letting God speak and learning to rest in the words that he speaks to us because his word is grace. The passage we're going to look at now as we wrap up this series then comes to us in the New Testament book of Hebrews. Hebrews uh, is a a remarkable book and you need to know know a little bit how it works in order for this to make sense. Hebrews uh, is written to Jewish believers in Jesus. They have all the Jewish laws and customs in their history, but they have come to believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And so Hebrews, one of the things that the writer of Hebrews does is he takes Old Testament themes like temple and sacrifice and priesthood, and he traces them out through the story of the scriptures. And we're going to see how Hebrews does that with this thing we call the Sabbath. Let's read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands. Now you're going to see this word rest uh, a number of times in this passage uh, and interchanged with Sabbath. Let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest as he said, has said, they shall, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day. Today, saying through David, so long afterward in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Well, I think that's perfectly clear. (laughs) I think there's nothing more I could add to that. You probably already perfectly understand that. (laughs) Only kidding. Uh, One of the keys, as I said, to understanding this passage is knowing what the writer's trying to do to trace us from the story of scriptures 
what rest means. And you saw the word rest and rested is used repeatedly there. And it's not always immediately clear. Well, what's he talking about? What does he mean by rest? Does he mean the same thing every time? Um, Part of the challenge here is that eight times in 11 verses, the, the word rest is used. And it's not used the same way. It's used in four distinct ways and they connect to each other, but they're not the same. And what I want to do is walk you through those four ways that the author uses the word rest to begin with. So we get to do that by drawing on the magic board. The first way the author uses the word rest is what we're going to call rest in creation. Rest in creation. Meaning, speaking specifically of when God created, the seventh day he rested from his works. This is crucial to understanding what the author is talking about here. In fact, if we go back for a minute, we'll see. In, in verse 4, Hebrews 4.4, 4, For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. God, when he set, and we talked about this in the very first sermon of the series, when God created the world, he set in the fabric of creation a rhythm of rest, which he participated in. And his rest is not because he's fatigued or worn out or exhausted. He's omnipotent. His rest is specifically to be satisfied in, to enjoy. In fact, um, F.B. Meyer writes this, Whereas we are expressly told of the evening and the morning of the first six days of creation, there is no reference to the dawn or the close of God's rest day, and we're left to infer that it's beyond time, independent of duration, unlimited and eternal. I love that. For six days, evening and morning, day one, evening and morning, day two, but on the seventh day, no evening or morning, no beginning or end, meaning it's meant to be with us forever. So the first way the author of Hebrews speaks about rest is speaking about the rest of creation. God rested, and he put it into how we were made, how the world's meant to run. The passage goes on, though, and it speaks about another kind of rest. We'll get there in a second. And we're going to call this rest in Canaan, or in the promised land. As the author goes on, it speaks that the rest for God's people had a specific location in the Old Testament. Rest in Canaan, the promised land. That there was a place connected to what God meant by his rest. We'll see that in the text here in a moment. I know, I'm getting pretty good at this. And again in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest, speaking specifically of the land, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward, and the word's already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now this is a little bit confusing, but it's quoting from Psalm 95, verse 11. And in Psalm 95, 11, this is the retelling of the story of the disobedience of the Israelites in the wilderness. And you can read about this story uh, in Numbers chapter 14. The a whole generation of God's people disbelieved his promises. They had good news preached to them the good news of God's future for them. He's going to bring them to a land where they'll be free from their slavery. He's going to let them settle in and enjoy uh, fellowship with each other and his protection and provision. He's going to do something for them better than what they have yet experienced, and they don't believe it. They don't trust it. They desire what they had before. They want to go back, and so they don't enter. And a generation, almost an entire generation, dies out and does not enter into the rest of Canaan, the promised land. What can we learn from this? As a matter of fact, if we go uh, to Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15, we see, that we see this passage. You shall remember that you were a slave. Remember, this is crucial, that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. And the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God you commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. What's he saying? The law, this is right out of Ten Commandments, the law is connected to the memory of who you are. You see, Sabbath, in a sense, is telling us a story. 
It's telling us a story about who we are. Maybe in your family you grew up like this, I did, where there were stories about your early childhood, your parents when they were kids. My mom and dad talk about the early days when my dad was in the Navy or even before that when he was in school. They had nothing. In fact, they tell the story about how I slept in the top drawer of their dresser. That was my bassinet. They propped it up with a stick and they put little blankets in there because they didn't have much. And those stories become part of this is who, this is my, our family. Well, in a way, Sabbath is telling the people of God, this is who you are. Don't forget, you were slaves and God delivered you. Now think about that for a minute. Slaves don't get to rest. Slaves don't get to say, well, you know, hey, this is my Sabbath, so I'm taking a day off. They're under the thumb, the oppression of their masters. God is saying, that's who you were. But now that's, I have liberated you. I have delivered you. And so in a way, to, set, to rest, to Sabbath rest, is a declaration of our freedom. It's to say, we are not slaves, either in Egypt or to our work today, to performance, to the opinions of others, to our culture, which drives us. To, to rest is a declaration of freedom. It's a reminder telling us the story of who we really are in Christ. And the comparison between Israel's situation in the wilderness and those in King David's day and those in our day is really interesting. What they shared in common was this. They heard good news preached, but they hardened their hearts and wouldn't believe. So what's that mean for us? You've had good news preached to you. So have I. Good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do not harden your hearts. Do not resist. Do not distrust but believe in the message that God is sending to you, the invitation he's giving you in rest. Okay, there's a third way the author talks about rest. And this is what we talked about last week in the sermon, if you, if you were here. Uh, it is rest in Christ. This is, this is gospel rest. This is what all the rest in creation and the rest in Canaan are really pointing to because he says if Joshua, if, if, if the rest was just in the land, why would Joshua say there's another day coming? It's all pointing to something. Even when those that did enter the promised land didn't experience it fully. They did, there was still disobedience. There was still distrust. There was still restlessness, spiritually speaking and socially in every other way. So it's pointing some, forward to a future rest. Verses two through three highlight this. For good news, there it is, this is the gospel, came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them. Why? Because they were not united by faith, believing with those who had listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. This is crucial. Good news, the gospel, the message of Jesus Christ has come to us. And the way you enter his rest is by believing and trusting that he is who he said he is and he will do what he said he will do. Just to quote one passage from last week, Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, meaning everyone. We all carry burdens. We all have burdens of our past, of our present. We all have shame and guilt. We all have we all are weighed down, spiritually speaking. Come to me, all of you, and I will give you rest. Rest in Christ. Hebrew repeatedly tells us that the rest remains. I love this part of the story. Repeatedly, Hebrew says the rest remains. There's still an open invitation. That invitation remains for you and for me. The rest of God remained in creation. It remained in Canaan. It remained in the time of King David and in the age of the prophets. And it remains still today. You can enter in. And yet even for those who know the rest of the gospel, there is still a kind of restlessness in us. For even though we know our sins are forgiven, perhaps you're like, like this. This is how I describe myself often. I, I know that I'm forgiven and set free. I know that I don't have to work for my salvation. I can rest in that. I forget, but I can rest in that. And yet, when I look out at the world, I see brokenness and sin and oppression and injustice and violence. And there's a restlessness in my soul, not about my own acceptance, but about the condition of our world. 
our community. And this brings us to the fourth way rest is used. And I got to tell you, I did not plan out my circles very well, but here's the beautiful thing about the board. I can do this. Oh, look at that. And draw the next one. Because the fourth way rest is used. Rest in future promise. I tried hard to come up with the C so I could have some alliteration here, but I couldn't figure it out. I thought about completion, but I'm just going to call it future promise. Now I want you to see something. I want you to see the trajectory of rest in Hebrews chapter 4 and in the story of the Bible. There's a movement from how God created the world to what God's people Israel were looking for, the land, to what that ultimately pointed to in Jesus Christ and forgiveness of sin and perfect acceptance by his grace. And it points forward even still. But we have to locate ourselves in the story. Here's, this is always important to do when you're reading the story of the Bible. You have to know where you fit. And sometimes when you go to the I don't know if people go to the malls anymore. They don't much now. But back when you used to go to malls, you'd look on the map and you'd see the little spot that says you are here so you could orient yourself there. Well, let me put a little you are here spot for you. You and I are here. That's where we belong in the story. Let's go back for a moment and look at the next passage, Hebrews 4, 9 through 10. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. I love the word remains there still remains a Sabbath rest. Even for those of you who know Jesus and have received his grace and trusted him by faith, there still is something coming. This world isn't the final word. There still is a rest yet to come. A rest in the future promise of when God will restore all things. Remember the story of the man with a withered hand last week if you heard the sermon? When he said, stretch out your hand and it was restored. Restoration is what Sabbath is all about. Spiritual restoration, soul restoration, physical restoration, and restoration of all creation someday. There is a final rest still coming for us, the Bible promises. In verse, 25, verse 5 of chapter 21 of Revelation, John says, Behold, I'm making all things new. That's still to come. In fact, let's look at Revelation 22, this great picture of the final rest. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life. Remember that from Genesis? The tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. How our nation needs the healing that only God can bring. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be, in, will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of a lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Someday we'll do a series on, on, the, on the Revelation promises. But for now, I hope you can see at least one thing there that I want to point out to you. This picture of the healing of the nations, of perfect rest, perfect shalom, harmony between all people, nations, tribes, and tongues, and the Lord our God, is not a political solution. There's no party, no ideology, no person in office, no human institution will ever be able to accomplish this. It's never going to happen. The best we can get in this life is little partial glimpses. This is something only God can do. Let me go back once more to our little picture drawing. We look backward and we see that God did something in creation that we, have, we need to recover. And then the story of his people, he located his rest in a particular place. And then he locates his rest fundamentally in a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And someday that person, the Lord of the Sabbath, will come back and restore all things. The person in a place, in earth, right? A new earth, new heavens, new earth reality, when all will be right. We live right here, resting in his grace and mercy. 
hoping and longing and working for the day when he will restore perfect rest to us and to all of creation. And one of the lessons I think that we need to learn about, about Sabbath is that Sabbath doesn't just point us backwards. See this here. We tend to think of Sabbath as something long ago, this law that's kind of obscure and should we keep it or not? Sabbath fundamentally for those who belong to Jesus points us forward to who he is and to what he will do. Sabbath rest is not meant to look backward at a law that we're not sure how to keep, but to point us forward in hope to the Lord of the Sabbath himself. Okay, how do we enter this rest then? What do we do about it? First, let me just talk about what are the barriers to entering his rest? What holds us back? Again, Hebrews is helpful because it draws lessons from Israel's past that we need to learn from. Uh, In Hebrews 3, verse 19. So we see they were unable to enter. Why? Because of unbelief. The primary barrier throughout the Hebrews passage, Hebrews chapter 4, and the whole book of Hebrews, to entering the rest of God is unbelief. Well, what's that? Remember the Israelites? Failure to believe that God can be trusted. Ceasing to place your trust and full dependence and surrender into who he is and what he will do. For those of us following Jesus today, is he Lord, the King of Kings, or not? Is he on the throne and reigning or not? Is, does the election or the economy or what's happening in our culture, does it, does it put that up for grabs? Or is he still on the throne? Is he still Lord? So many things cause us to drift from this. Chapter 4, verse 2. For good news, the gospel came to us just as to them. But the message they heard, good news, did not benefit them. Why? Unbelief. They were not united by faith with those who listened. This is the primary barrier for all of us to enter into his rest. Even for those of us who say we believe, we're tempted to slip back, to start questioning and doubting. Good news has come to you. The story in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, when the apostles, Peter gives this sermon and the people are cut to the heart, or excuse me, Paul, they're cut to the heart. They say, what must we do to be saved? And the response is, believe. Repent and believe. Believe in the one who I'm proclaiming to you. Let me look at verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 11. As we talk about what we, can we do to enter his rest. What, what do we have to do specifically? A couple things. First, let us strive to enter that rest. Now, <laughs> that sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Striving and resting don't go together. How do, how do we strive and rest at the same time? That doesn't, sound, that doesn't make much sense. And strive sounds like it's at odds with rest. And it would be at odds with rest if we were talking about striving to earn God's acceptance. Striving to become uh, pleasing to God. Striving to, to make sure that we're saved. If that were the case, then striving has nothing to do with resting. But that's not what the passage is saying. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 says this, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to act for his good pleasure. Notice, Paul does not say you work for your salvation. Christ did that at the cross. It is finished. But work it out. Strive to let the salvation of Jesus Christ infiltrate your whole life, to penetrate all the way down to your heart, to change how you think and how you see people and how you interact with the world, how you forgive and ask for forgiveness, how you proclaim his truth. In other words, our salvation is not just a get out of hell free card we put in our back pocket and forget about. It's something that we need to work out into our whole lives. This is very similar to what the author of Hebrews is saying when he says strive to enter that rest. Strive to experience his grace more fully. Strive to trust him more completely. Strive to surrender more wholly. There's a part we play. Striving. This is actually a consistent theme throughout the Bible. In chapter 2, verse 1, the author of Hebrews says, Therefore, we must, we must pay a much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. We must pay much closer attention so that we don't drift away. Because we do drift. I drift, and so do you. And so we must strive to pay attention. 
And then the next passage, uh, Hebrews 3, verses 12 to 13. A couple other words here to take note of. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. There it is, unbelief again. Leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So we strive, we take care, and we exhort. This, this word literally means to encourage. The three things we can do to enter his rest is strive to trust him more completely and to take care, watch ourselves, pay attention, ask God, help me see where am I drifting from your gospel? Where am I believing lies? Where am I getting off track? And then encourage each other, exhort one another. I think many of us don't do this for one reason. We presume that person already knows. We think, well, who am I to tell her? I mean, she's more spiritual than I am, or he's got it more together than I do. Uh, Who am I? Exactly, who are you? You're a child of the living God, and that's your brother or sister in Christ, and you're told, exhort one another. They need that from you. I need that from you. We need that from each other. Peter says in one of his letters, he says, Therefore, I will always remind you of these things, even though you already know them and are firmly established in the truth. It doesn't matter that you say you're a Christian. We all drift. And one of the ways God brings us back on course is each other. So three things we can do to enter his rest. Strive personally to trust him. Pay attention to my life and my thoughts and encourage the people around me. Because, finally, verse 1 Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. The promise still stands. I love this. Same thing he uses in verse 9, that it remains. The promise remains. Friends, there remains for you a promise of rest. For all of you. For those of you that think, I've screwed up too badly too many times for God to forgive me again, the promise of his rest still remains. For those of you who think, I'm so burdened by what I've done in the past or what's been done to me in the past, you carry around in this backpack on your shoulders all of the weight of your past. The promise of his rest still remains for those that are just racked with anxiety and fear and worry about the future, about what's to come. The promise of his rest still remains for you. For those of you that feel invisible and unseen and wonder if God notices or cares about what you're dealing with, the promise of his rest still remains for you. For those of you that are questioned by doubts and you have questions and and doubts and you just don't know enough and you wonder if you'll ever have all the answers, the promise of his rest still remains for you. And for those, many of us, who are just exhausted from the treadmill of life, trying to measure up and prove ourselves, oh, the promise of his rest still remains for you too. There remains still a promise of God's rest available for you today to enter into it, to know that you're loved and accepted, and to give you not just security now, but hope for the future. Uh, Years ago, a friend and mentor of mine said to me three things about the gospel. He says, the gospel tells me three things. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. And my future is secure. Isn't that good? That's what it means to enter his rest, to know that I don't carry the past. Christ has paid for it. My present makes sense despite the craziness of our culture. And my future is secure because Christ holds it. That's what it means to enter his rest. The promise of his rest still stands, friends. And one of the ways Christians have historically reminded each other about this promise, celebrate it, and enter into it, is through communion. And so if you're uh, ready at home, I'll give you a moment as I pray to gather the elements, go grab the the bread and drink. If you're you're ready, then pray along with me. But gather your family members together, get the communion elements together as we pray and prepare our hearts to symbolically enter his rest once again. Let's pray. Father God, we pause and acknowledge that many of us are worn out and weary. We're carrying heavy burdens. We're racked with doubts and questions and fears and anxieties. And we give you great praise, O Jesus, Lord of the Sabbath, 
that the promise of your rest still remains for us. And right now in this moment, spread out but gathered together, we remember. We take care. We stir each other up and and remind one another as your spirit reminds us through bread and cup of what you have done, what you are doing, and what you will do. We thank you for that, what you accomplished at the cross, giving us a salvation that we could never earn for ourselves and giving us a hope that we do not deserve, but we receive by faith, purely by your grace. Speak the words we need to hear. Speak the words of calm and rest into our restless hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Gather your bread together, pass it amongst yourselves. And I remind you that Jesus called himself the bread of life. He took bread, he gave it to his disciples, and he said to his disciples, this is my body, it's given for me, for you. Do this in remembrance of him. The Bible tells us that after they had eaten the bread together, Jesus poured out a cup And pass it to his disciples. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sins, to give you the rest of forgiveness and grace. Drink this and remember him. Amen. May you go this day, this week, this year, and your whole life resting in the grace of the Lord Jesus, the Lord of rest. Amen. Go in peace.